Hello, friends. It's your boy, Mr. Stone, and I'm back at it again, trying to teach you guys about moment of inertia. You see, regular inertia is just another way of saying mass, but it's a way of saying mass that acknowledges what mass does, other than, of course, determining your weight in a gravitational field. Mass has the ability to prevent you from accelerating when a force is applied to you. The more mass you have, the harder it is to get you up to a high speed by pushing on you. Furthermore, if you have less mass, then it's very easy for any given force to buffalo you into uh, accelerating greatly. You'll remember way, way back, a long time ago when we were learning about inertia at the beginning of the class, I discussed the uh, case of Becky's different Jeeps being slammed into the back of a Jeep, a uh, tractor trailer full of Mountain Dew Kickstart, and finally, uh, Granny Jenkins on the Vespa. Well, things that are moving angularly as opposed to linearly also have inertia. However, it's not just their mass that matters. As you've seen with every angular quantity so far, the radius or the radial distance away from the axis of rotation, the point around which it spins, is also going to matter. Uh, and in fact, you've probably noticed this in different parts of your life, just haven't necessarily thought of it. You might be thinking, Mr. Stone, didn't we already go over torque? Like, that's the force that makes you angularly accelerate. If you have a torque and it bounces out, then you don't start spinning. Like when you're on the seesaw, yeah, yeah, we covered all that. But every case that we did, you'll notice, going back and looking at your torque sheet, the net torque was always zero. And you were trying to use the torques to either figure out where to put the fulcrum or how much force is on one side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, with moment of inertia, we'll be able to do torque when it is not at equilibrium. So it'll expand our repertoire to go over um, moment of inertia and then revisit torque. Let's start with moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is an object's tendency to resist angular acceleration, similar to how regular mass or inertia is your ability to resist translational acceleration. In order to determine an object's moment of inertia, we can use this formula. Moment of inertia I I know what you're thinking. We've already used that for current. Well, that's in a different unit, so we get to reuse it. The sum of mass times distance from the axis of rotation squared. It looks awfully familiar. It looks rather like our formula for center of mass. And that's because center of mass is finding the one point at which all of the masses and their locations balance out. This is more about the distribution itself. You'll notice that this doesn't come out to just give you the location of a point. This will give you meters squared for distance squared times kilograms. So why are we so concerned with this? Well, it acknowledges that the mass distribution is going to determine whether or not something spins easily or whether it is difficult to spin. The simplest case that you could possibly find the moment of inertia for is where you have one object with mass going around a point at one distance. Uh, so the simplest case would be that of a point mass. What does that look like? Well, you would have an object with a mass that we treat as a point because we're only worried about its center of mass. 
and it could be going around some axis over here. As this point mass goes in this circle, round and round, we have one point mass, one radial distance. Therefore, when we sum it up, we don't have anything to add it to. So for a point mass, your moment of inertia is just mass radius squared. Nice and easy. Also easy would be the case of a hoop or a ring or a tire, a situation where you have a circle shape going around its uh, axis of symmetry, the middle point where the uh, uh, axle or whatever of a bicycle tire would go. So what does this look like? you would have a ring of material, which means that all of the mass would be located along the rim of it. And you are going to rotate it around this center point right here. So it'd be going like this. Well, what makes this so easy? Well, unlike this, where all the mass was in one place, we've got mass at one location that spreads all the way around. So let's take a slice of it right here. From this point that's rotating, you've got half of the mass going around that point right there in this line. Half of the mass is on this side, one radius away, and then half of the mass is on this side one radius away. So we're going to get one half m r squared plus one half m r squared as our sum of our mass radiuses is, is squared. Well, one half plus one half is one m r squared. Thus, we end up going back to what we had for the point mass. Where did that bring you? Back to me. Another compelling comparison to make would be between the hoop, where all of the mass is located on the rim, and the disc, which is solid. If they both rotate around the same point in the center, then we have to contend with, we've already established that this would just be mr squared, but what would the disc be? Think about it, there is mass from here to here. So what does that do? That means that your center point of the mass on this side has to actually end up being closer, closer to the center uh, where all of the mass averages out and might be located more like here rather than all the way out. So if these two things had identical mass, the only thing that changed would be our radial distance for the location of the mass. So that would draw that in. Thus, it has a lower center uh, of uh, mass on each side, lowering the moment of inertia. So it'd be half mr squared as opposed to mr squared. You won't be expected to derive these or even necessarily memorize them. There's a reference sheet of the moments of inertia of common objects and shapes included with the practice for this lesson as posted on Edsby. Otherwise, it'll probably just be given to you in the question itself. So we're setting up for a race that'll teach you something about moment of inertia. 
Here I have a hollow plastic wheel with eight slots inside of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I guess technically there's four more, but we're not going to use them. And we have these large ball bearings, kind of like the ones we used for the shoot for your grade lab. This wheel I'm going to leave exactly like it's set up. So I'm going to close that up, put my washer and wing nut back on. Now notice that the wing nut t can teach you something about torque as well. Your average uh, nut would not have these extension wings on it, so it would be a lot harder to tighten or loosen by hand. However, a wing nut has these extra handle parts that extend the radius, so the force that you can supply by hand can give you enough torque to uh, tighten or loosen it as required. For this wheel, what I'm going to do is move the masses out to the outer four. So the same amount of mass is distributed around each of these wheels, however, this one has the masses closer to the center. This one has them farther apart. Now think about this in terms of your moment of inertia of these wheels. That is the measurement of how responsive they are to torque uh, and how easily they resist angular acceleration. For your reference, if you're trying to figure out uh, the, any kind of number value, here are some measurements I made. Notice that the wheel with the ball bearings closer in has the center of those ball bearings about one and a half centimeters away from the axis of rotation, whereas the one that has the ball bearings in the outer slots has the center of each ball bearing about three and a half centimeters away from the axis of rotation. All right, so here's the race. We've got the two wheels and a plywood ramp. I've got them held at the same uh, height on the ramp. Let's see who wins. Well, this one definitely went faster. Let's see who you were. Moving the wing nut. And it was the one with the ball bearings closer to the center. Here we have the situation between our two wheels. Wheel one has a distance from each ball bearing to the center, a radial distance, one and a half centimeters. R2 would be three and a half centimeters for the other wheel. They're closer to the outside of the edge. Uh, so it's unsurprising that with this quantity being greater, it should have a greater moment of inertia. How much greater? Well, R1 is 1.5, R2 is 3.5. That is a proportional distance, uh, difference of this one being 2.3 times R1. Okay, so if we take the moment of inertia of the other one, R1, and then multiply 2.3 times its R, we should get the one for the other. But the R is squared. 2.3 squared is going to give us 5.45-ish times. So the second one's moment of inertia is 5.45 times greater than the first one's moment of inertia. So it's going to get about six times less angular acceleration for the same torque being applied to it.
now that we've established who would win the race and we have our suspicions as to why, let's think about it. The one with the mass closest to the center won the race. It had a lower moment of inertia, just as we saw with the hoop and the disc. Lower moment of inertia made it easier to start rotating to get down the ramp. However, if it had a higher moment of inertia, it's going to take a little while longer to get speeded up, but just like it's harder to hit the brakes on a semi-truck than it is uh, in Becky's Monday Jeep and come to a complete stop, that is, it would be harder to stop something once it's going if it was a hoop than a disc. Similar to the race between the two wheels packed with ball bearings is the action of spinning a lightsaber. When you spin a lightsaber, you want to make sure that you hold it near the center of mass because it's going to give you the most control. In other words, it gives you a nice low moment of inertia. Most of the mass in the lightsaber is concentrated in the hilt. Our center of mass is somewhere right around the end of the hilt. So if we hold it, say, right here, well, there's more mass over here, but you got a nice low radius to, to cancel out some of the largeness of that mass value. And over here, we might have more radius, but we've got a really, really low amount, amount of mass. When you add those together, it gives you a low total moment of inertia. A low total moment of inertia means that any torque can cause a great acceleration on it. So just a little bit of action at the wrist, and you can get it to start spinning pretty quickly. You can also decelerate it very suddenly as well. This allows you to get up to pretty fantastic speeds and pretty fantastic sudden changes in velocity in terms of direction or stopping as well. When you hold it a little bit further away, you're giving up some of that control by having a slightly higher moment of inertia because the mass is going to be uh, a little bit less evenly distributed. So now it's a little bit harder to get it up to speed and it's a little bit harder to stop it. What would be the greatest moment of inertia that you could possibly swing your lightsaber with? Alternatively, why don't you hold your lightsaber from the blade? Well, obviously, you'd cut your hand off. But if you trained uh, with the appropriate Jedi Master, perhaps you can master the technique as well. But holding it from the blade means that the hilt's all the way over here. And if the hilt, which is the heavy part, is all the way over here, then I have a great radius, ma uh, a radius amount, and I have a great mass amount, which gives me a huge moment of inertia making it hard to get it up to speed. And then when I want to stop it, it keeps going past the point I try to stop it at, and then it actually has to bounce back to the point. And it's funny because it's just, you have so little control over it. Moment of inertia. Why then would a device built to spin, like Boba's toy fidget spinner here, have weights on the outside far from the center so that it keeps spinning even when Bo tries to stop it? Uh, you can begin to imagine, okay, so if tires have uh, a harder time getting up to speed, well, they also have a harder time slowing back down. That is in and of itself a kind of advantage. Uh, think of like bottle rockets where you want to have enough inertia to keep going against air resistance, but you don't want to have so much that you can't get off the ground in the first place. The same considerations need to be made for tires. Now, I told you we'd do this again with torque, but let's consider the quantities that we've talked about. Torque is the angular analog to force, as in when it's applied, something accelerates. Moment of inertia is the angular analog to inertia. An angular acceleration is the angular analog 
to linear acceleration. Thus, as this is true, so too is this. So here we have an angular version of Newton's second law of motion. Now there is one more factor that is important, and that's of course our radial distance, but that matters for both of these, so I'll put it in the middle. But here's the neat trick. If torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration, what is angular acceleration in terms of these two things, linear acceleration and uh, radius? So linear acceleration is angular times radius. So angular should be linear divided by radius. What is this in terms of radius and mass? For point mass or hoop or whatever, it's mr squared. Plug those together. Torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration. You would get mass times acceleration, radius divided by radius, and then times radius again. So you'd get MAR, thus torque, MA is force, is force times radius, but you already knew that. Kind of neat to see those formulae come together. And you almost feel that uh, understanding coalescing an example problem for you. We have a system of two wheels, an inner wheel and an outer wheel. Uh, apparently they're actually next to each other. So we would have, if we viewed this from like above, we've got a bigger wheel and a smaller wheel. So something more like that. So a system of two wheels fixed to each other is free to rotate around a frictionless axis through the common center of the wheels and perpendicular to the page. Four forces are exerted tangentially to the rims of the wheels as shown below. What is the magnitude of the net torque on the system about the axis? Well, we have two ways we can find torque. Torque our net torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration, or we can find net torque from net force radius. Notice that these are all perpendicular to it. This is applied at a right angle to the center. So we have sine 90, so don't worry about that. All of these are perpendicular to the radius. Which one of these is more useful for what we get, are given? Are we given that these are disks or solid uh, versus uh, hoops? No. And we're also not given any angular accelerations. So probably using this form of torque is gonna be uh, more useful for us. Net torque is just like net force. In fact, this will begin to look familiar. Net torque is I times A, oh, I times alpha. But then it's also the sum of all of these things. So we have two Fs that would make it rotate clockwise. If you pull it this way, it should rotate like that. Uh, clockwise is a negative, so this would be negative 2F applied at a radius of 3R. Then we have a positive torque because it would make it go counterclockwise, also applied at 3R. We have a positive F applied at 2R. 
and a positive F applied at three R again. This is kind of like adding up all the forces on an object like we used to do. Negative six FR, that should be capitalized, plus three FR plus two FR plus three FR makes our net torque negative six plus three is negative three plus three is zero. Thus, our net torque shall be 2 FR in the positive counterclockwise direction. Nice and easy. Trick is you just have to figure out which torque definition works for the problem that you're given. A wheel with rotational inertia I is mounted to a fixed frictionless axle. The angular speed omega of the wheel is increased from zero to uh, omega F in a time interval T. What is the average net torque on the wheel during this time interval? Before we choose our torque definition, we are given a moment of inertia I an angular initial speed of zero, an angular final speed of uh, omega f in a time interval t. Since we're given moment of inertia, I'm thinking we probably want to use torque is moment of inertia angular acceleration. However, none of the things we're given are angular acceleration. But there is a definition of angular acceleration uh, that is independent of this. Angular acceleration is the change in angular velocity over time. We put these two together, I think we can solve it. Our angular acceleration will need to be our change, that is omega final minus zero, divided by t. What's omega final minus zero? It's just omega final. i times omega final is i times omega final. Thus here is our net torque. We don't have any values to plug in other than that. But that's all right. We plugged in what they gave us, so we must be right. One last one. A light rod with masses attached to its ends is pivoted about a horizontal axis as shown above. When released from rest in a horizontal orientation, the rod begins to rotate with an angular acceleration of what magnitude? So this is a seesaw question. However, we're not going to get a balance. Light rigid rod, I imagine that the light means that we can ignore the mass of the rod itself. And we've got these masses attached to the ends. Ah, uh, I think I've got it. This, if we ignore the mass of the rod, what does that make this mass? A point mass. We've got another point mass over here. So we'll just use the, the moment of inertia is the sum of mass times radius. Now sum means that we can just find what we've got and add them together. So the mass on this side is three mass naught and it is L away from the fulcrum as the radial distance, which must be squared. Sum, which means add M naught on the other side, two L, but two L gets squared. So it'll be four L squared. 
three mass naught L2 plus four mass naught L, uh, L2 L squared. But three plus four is seven is the important thing. Seven mass naught L squared. So now we've got the moment of inertia. Now we need to find the torque. Why? Because we're trying to find angular acceleration. Torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration. We're trying to find, we can't have two unknowns. We've got to use both definitions of torque. If these start out horizontal, then we've got forces creating torques, one in this direction, one in this direction. The force of weight on this side and the force of weight on that side. So our net torque This one is in the counterclockwise, so let's make it positive. This one is in the clockwise, let's make it negative. Three mass naught L. That is our mass, our radius, but mass is not a force. We're worried about weight, so we also need to throw in a G for gravity. Mass times gravity gives you weight. That's a force applied to a leverage of L. We're good. On the other side, which is the negative side because it'd make you rotate clockwise, mass naught 2LG, 3 mass naught LG minus 2 mass naught LG. is going to be mass naught LG. Now we know the moment of inertia. Now we know the met, net torque, so it should be doable to find the angular acceleration from those two. M naught LG equals seven M naught L squared acceleration. Move this to the other side. M naught is on the top and the bottom. L is on the top and the bottom but it's squared on the bottom, so it doesn't cancel out entirely. So our acceleration shall be one seventh G over L, or G over seven L, if you'd prefer to write it that way. With that, you should be prepared to tackle this week's practice sheet. Good luck. Don't go fast. Get the easy points. Adios, kids.